Um, hi everyone, my name is Dan Banger. Um, welcome and thanks again for uh, spending your evening with us today. Uh, my name is Dan Banger. I do lead a small team of business development managers at AWS and what we do is that we do focus on um, AI platforms and engines, essentially everything that can enable data scientists to be successful uh, with their journey with machine learning. And today specifically, um, I have the honor and pleasure to have my friend and former colleague uh, from Facebook, Joe Spisek, joining me today. Thank you. Glad to be here. And uh, you guys are in for a treat. Uh, there's a lot of content to cover, so um, we're going to be going a little bit faster. But just a, a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, one is um, we will be covering some, some code as, as part of the demo. Um, the code is available for you to, to copy and then play with today on GitHub, so don't worry about uh, trying to figure everything out right now. Uh, the slides as well will be available immediately for you to, to take home and, and then play around with, so don't worry too much about that piece. And also, um, this is a 400-level session. Today, what we, what we decided to do, Joe and I, is to dig deeper into the PyTorch experience for the developer or data scientist and try to uh, come up with a message that really puts aside all the definitions and everything that you might probably want to read um, on your own and then digs really deep into the best practices, uh, the opportunity of PyTorch, why PyTorch, what is the strategy that Facebook had in mind when they built PyTorch as well as what we do at Amazon Web Services uh, that enables PyTorch to essentially be uh, a very compelling deep learning framework on the cloud. So it's going to be a deep dive. Like I said, it's a 400 level session. I have some code on the side and I also have a lot of slides to cover. So I'll, I'll, I'll dig right away. Uh, just for my own calibration, who here is familiar with PyTorch and who here is probably running a team or part of a team that is using PyTorch pretty much every day? All right. Okay. Better than I hoped. Perfect. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot for the calibration. Again, my name is Dan Banger. Uh, today with me is Joe, who would dig into the PyTorch experience uh, from a Facebook perspective. I started with this. Thank you. And the, one of the key reasons, one of the key drivers that we all hear today, and I believe that you, you are aware of that as well, is that we, we are all into technology and we are all into trying to uh, touch the, the next level, the next stage as far as technology is concerned. What are the top 10 digital trends that are out there that are really giving AI and machine learning an opportunity today? And so I decided to put this, to, this 10, I mean, I, I got them from, from Gartner, uh, but it's, it's interesting to look at where the world is going in terms of technology, where we're building autonomous things, we're dealing with blockchain, smart spaces, digital, uh, et and, digital and ethics, sorry, digital ethics and privacy, quantum computing, and an empowered edge where uh, computing is coming closer and closer to end users as possible. And if you dig deeper into all of these new paradigms in technology, we realize that all of them involve some form of AI machine learning. Uh, I know that AI is very visible nowadays with all the examples that um, you, you get you know, from a marketing standpoint, but it's also these optimization game that is a very back-end related artificial intelligence practice that we don't get to talk about a lot, but that actually exists, right? So what we see at Amazon Web Services for the past you know, couple of years, working with tens of thousands of active developers, building machine learning models, adopting different frameworks of machine learning on the cloud, is that there's a 250% growth year over year that we're capturing simply because of the opportunity to leverage cloud infrastructures and leverage cloud scale and leverage cloud paradigms and leverage you know, platforms like SageMaker to accelerate the process through which uh, developers and data scientists deploy and then build and then train machine learning models. We are also seeing eight out of 10 typical machine learning and deep learning workloads running on AWS today, including the benchmarks. And so I believe you're familiar with most of these customers. Uh, Intuit is using AWS SageMaker to build fraud detection models. We're having very good use cases coming from companies like Sony in media and entertainment. If you're using ZocDoc to go to the, to the doctor, 
you're probably using a TensorFlow model built on top of AWS in the back end. Um, another example of, of a customer that I like calling out, a pretty recent one, is Siemens, where using TensorFlow and SageMaker, they were able to bring the computational time that they used to basically build machine learning models from 12 hours to 30 seconds. It's really incredible. And in sports analytics as well, we're seeing a lot of movement from folks like the NFL, or from folks like Formula One, handling terabytes and terabytes of data, piping that over to the cloud, and then using that to provide a different experience that the folks that are uh, watching the games or the folks that are watching the races are having simply because of the opportunity of deep learning or AI and the combination of, of, of uh, that and then streaming analytics. So our approach at AWS is very simple. Well, first of all, we customer focus. 90 to 95% of our roadmap is driven by our customers. And then secondly, we're very aggressive at the pace at which we do innovate. Right, so we aggressively listen to our customers and then we go deeper and deeper in terms of breadth and depth to make sure that we talk to or everything that we build is speaking directly to our customers' demand. And of course, with that, we, what, we've observed, what we've observed is that customers are coming to us and asking us uh, to provide PyTorch, for example, as a deep learning framework. Uh, it doesn't matter whether Amazon created that or not. In the case of PyTorch, for example, We've worked with Facebook to make sure that PyTorch is optimized for the cloud and running on AWS. And of course, we secure that and we inject research and development in everything that we build. If you look at the world of AI today, typically you have developers partnering with data scientists in order to build real-time applications, where you get a developer uh, or a DevOps person that is getting essentially the um, bill of quantities or the requirements that a data scientist has in order to put the real product in, in production. And what I want to challenge you uh, to think about, or what I want to get all of us to think about today, is the whole concept that I package into um, AI-driven development. And by AI-driven development, I mean a combination of bringing AI development tools together with algorithms and end-to-end -end machine learning platforms and overall machine learning models and templates combined all together in some form of workflow or process that is captured by a single platform. And that's the opportunity that we have today. The opportunity that we have today is to package all the best practices in terms of platform automation, in terms of model and templating and packaging SDKs and libraries and examples and everything that developers have to use on a day-to-day -day basis in a single platform and of course algorithms as well. So that's why we built SageMaker. And SageMaker is essentially a suite of platforms and services capabilities uh, that enable machine learning developers and data scientists to build, train, tune, and deploy machine learning models um, every day. Who here is not familiar with SageMaker? Okay, just a few people, perfect. Then we don't have to get into that. So in SageMaker, you can have PyTorch alongside many other deep learning frameworks, as well as the infrastructure that comes around with it, um, and, uh, yeah, and some higher level capabilities, like an integration with a deep lens uh, a device, which is a developer first camera, that makes it possible to deploy machine learning models um, uh, on the field. And all of that is available behind an API. So if you think about Amazon SageMaker, it's really that environment that templatizes and packages the capability to spin up infrastructure that comes pre-configured with all of these machine learning and deep learning frameworks, including PyTorch, which is the focus of our conversation today, and then builds that end-to-end -end machine learning workflow behind an API. And if you pay attention uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, you might hear much more capabilities that are coming to the company SageMaker. So digging deeper a little bit into that, uh, so SageMaker has this environment that enables data scientists to build machine learning models. So Jupyter Notebooks as a service. You guys heard about that, I'm not gonna get into the details. The second thing it provides is a training environment, which is again available behind an API and a managed platform to just spin off machine learning training jobs and then process them at scale, including hyperparameter optimization. And speaking of hyperparameter optimization, the difference between 92% uh, accurate model and a 95, 96% accurate model is probably how you tweak the exact same model mm. and how does the platform enable you to get that capability uh, available. And the last thing about the platform 
is the ability to deploy machine learning models um, at scale. And of course, all of that is packaged with uh, metadata capability, pay as you go, and compliance, and end-to-end uh, -end VPC and encryption support. Now, the reason I take us through this process is because the platform was built and designed to work with deep learning frameworks like PyTorch in a way that is seamless and in a way that makes the life of the developer and data scientists easier. And that's what we're going to jump into um, right now. So to dig into uh, the PyTorch experience on top of a deep learning, uh, on top of the SageMaker platform, um, I decided to walk you through the anatomy, what I call the anatomy of a deep learning framework on top of Amazon SageMaker. If you look at the developer's experience, well, it usually starts either on the developer's laptop, and by developer here, I mean data scientist, developer, AI researcher, pretty much anyone that has something to do with a machine learning or deep learning framework. So they would start with the, the laptop or a Jupyter notebook somewhere, and then when they start interacting with Amazon SageMaker or on the AWS cloud, they have access to the, core, the three core capabilities of a platform that I called out earlier. The notebook instance, the training and tuning capability. And so the, the reddish or the, the arrows over there represent the control capabilities that the developer or the data scientist has. You can either spin up a Jupyter notebook environment or model training environment or model hosting environment with the controls of encryption and the control of access control and, and all of these things that are provided by sister services. And the relationship with the cloud storage is provided with Amazon S3, which is an infinite, infinitely scalable cloud storage capability, making it possible for developers to essentially store data and then seamlessly communicate with the platform and extract that. And so this is where PyTorch <coughs> and SageMaker and the other deep learning frameworks come in, where the relationship of SageMaker with uh, Amazon ECR makes it possible that we can store algorithms in the form of the Docker containers and then use these Docker containers to kick off what we call machine learning training jobs or tuning jobs or all these other capabilities in that environment. And of course, we, need, we use AWS CloudWatch logs to store the logs externally so that we don't have to maintain that, maintain that infrastructure running at all time. And then it's possible for you to run a training job and then kick it off at the end of the, the training job execution. And so if you want to dig deeper slightly into the Jupyter Notebook instance, pretty simple. It's a machine that is attached to an EBS volume and a number of Jupyter Notebook examples there to get ramped up and get started faster. And then there's a lot of PyTorch-related examples there as well to get started. Now, from a model training perspective, it becomes interesting. So this is an ephemeral cluster that spins up, again, with a PyTorch container. And then it's attached to an EBS volume in which we download the data from the cloud storage with the possibility of streaming the data in directly to the machines to start training the models. And then we use that to train the machine learning model. And then after we're done, you have the possibility to host that either in a managed um, um, real-time endpoint environment or in a batch inference uh, endpoint environment. So I believe you're familiar with that. Now, uh, the, the last thing as far as the workflow and the infrastructure is concerned, is that you can consume your machine learning model using AWS Lambda and API Gateway. So I hope from here you see how SageMaker fits um, in the middle of the execution of basically building, training, and deploying machine learning models um, um, at scale. Now, where we want to focus our attention now is what happens within the container once a PyTorch container, for example, is, is pulled in. So, the first thing to note within that environment is a data agent that exists in SageMaker. Basically, the data agent's role is to communicate with the cloud storage and then go fetch the data from there on behalf of, of, of the customer. So what happens is that when a training job comes on, the data is handed over to the Docker containers by the data agent. The other thing is the log metric agents that runs within the container that can, again, you know, handle the logs. If you have multiple machines that are working together, different deep learning frameworks, it's possible to go get these logs from all these machines, aggregate them, and push them to the cloud storage. And if you start going up the stack, then you have things like the distributed and CUDA uh, um, GPU capabilities that are installed there if, in case um, uh, you're using a deep learning uh, GPU-based machine. And when you start going up the stack from there, then you have the deep learning libraries with the uh, uh, 
the deep learning framework and additional libraries that are related to that. And then you go further up the stack, you have the SageMaker Python SDK. And the SageMaker Python SDK is very, very powerful. It's actually the core of the best experience a deep learning practitioner can have on Amazon SageMaker today. It makes a lot of thing e things easier, things like spinning up their environment, configuring that, handling hyperparameters, and all these things. I'll get into some of the details. And then at the very top of the stack, you get the algorithm. The algorithm is now what you would write as a script. For example, if you would want to create a deep learning distributed uh, a job with PyTorch, you wouldn't have to write the GPU code. You wouldn't have to write the data handling capabilities. The data is handed over to you by the data agent. You wouldn't have to worry about where to find the different log files because the logs are handled um, by the log agent, and so on and so forth. Now, if you use the SageMaker SDK and you do import SageMaker, you get direct access to a decent number of capabilities that we are going to jump into um, right now. Oh, something that. I have actually done. So I figured, before I continue, I figured I could share my screen and then get the job started. Let me mirror the screen. Are you seeing my screen? Mm -hmm. Is the resolution okay? It's pretty small. Is it big enough? Okay. Yep. So this is essentially the example that we're going to go through um, uh, as a demo sometime later. But I wanted to make sure that I kick the job off and then it starts training, even though um, even though, even though I ran it already, and uh, I will show you the result immediately. But at least you could see that I'm kicking off a SageMaker job from my own laptop, from my own uh, uh, um, VS Code environment. And then I'll walk you through the details here and what does that mean and so on and so forth, if it lets me. Oh, I'll, I'll kick off another job so that we can see there. Okay, perfect. Now back to the slides. Okay, so once you start digging into uh, the SageMaker Python SDK, things look like this. We're familiar with the stack already. Um, the anatomy of a typical uh, piece of code, you leveraging the SageMaker Python SDK makes it so easy to get the job started. And I'm gonna walk you through what you need to do, what does that mean, and so on and so forth. So, of course, it starts, it starts by uh, importing SageMaker, which is a Python SDK that gives you access to the PyTorch container. And so when you do import SageMaker PyTorch, and that gives you access to a few classes. One of them is PyTorch, which is basically the estimator. Who here is familiar with, with scikit-learn? Okay, perfect, a good deal of people. So you can think of the SageMaker estimator as a weak analogy of scikit-learn, uh, where you can essentially have an environment and leveraging that environment, you have a context, and then through that context, if you do, if you do a dot .fit or fit deploy, you have the capability of training a machine learning model given that context. So the experience is almost similar. When you do import the SageMaker PyTorch um, estimator, it gives you the capability of specifying uh, your main script, for example, the script that you want to use for training your machine learning model. And with, uh, alongside other parameters, things like the training instance type, the one that you want to use, the training instance count, and the framework version. In this case, I specified PyTorch 1.0, the, the development uh, uh, branch right now that Facebook is, is pushing to, to get to, to a release candidate. And then you also have to specify the hyperparameters. Now, if you look at this carefully, you haven't specified the way that the data was going to be distributed to the different machines. You haven't specified the way that the logs were going to get handled. You haven't specified all of these distributed PyTorch uh, uh, mechanisms. And then those are the kind of things that the platform handles in the back end. You haven't specified how much data you want to send to one machine or the other. Sharding is handled automatically. 
whether you want to fully replicate the data or you want to send part of the data to a machine or, or the other. So there are some of these backend capabilities that are handled by the platform, but it understands PyTorch well enough to know that if you want to do distributed training with PyTorch, then you have access to different backend capabilities as far as distributed training is concerned, and it provides that to you. Now, once you have an estimated object, the next thing you need to do is to say, hey, given my estimator, I want you to fit that on this data set. Now, note here that the data set comes with two, uh, in the dictionary, with two types of parameters. One is the training parameter, which is analogous to the training uh, data set, and it's pointing to Amazon S3. And the other one is the test, um, uh, what we call channel, that is still pointing to Amazon S3. So once you do this, what the platform does is, okay, you want to use PyTorch, you've given me this estimator, I know what your main function is, and I know where your data is. So with your permission, I'm going to go download that entire data set, bring it down to the platform in a specific magic folder that I'm going to make accessible to your deep learning framework, and then your deep learning framework can pick that up and leverage the distribution capabilities in the back end um, that I provide. And so once the model is trained, um, the environment also knows where to go pick up the model and then send it back to the cloud storage and where to go pick up the logs and then send it back to the cloud logs capabilities. And so the next thing that is left for you to do is to, be, to essentially deploy the model in the production environment. So with D-E-P-L-O-Y, six letters uh, specifically, you can instruct and summon SageMaker and say, hey, bring me a machine of this type, MLC4 extra large, for example, and then I want three of these machines, and then within these three machines, I want you to host the REST API and then host my model there for me. And that's the entire, that's the entire story. So if you take a step back and then look at what it means to kick off a, a, a machine learning training job with three uh, computers um, in, in that environment, it looks like this. You have access to your data, again, and then the data agents in these three machines are all going to the cloud storage and fetching the logs, um, uh, sorry, fetching the data back into, into the machine. And then so it puts that into a magic folder called OptML data. And then at the distribution layer, the platform understands how to make these uh, PyTorch distributed capabilities working together in order to share things like checkpoints, in order to share things like global steps, in order to share things like that are required for running a, a distributed training job. And then the next thing that we're going to get to talk about in details right now is the experience. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, after the model is done training, the data is pushed, the model is pushed back to the cloud storage. And then the logs are also pushed to the, to the cloud logs. And so we're going up the stack into what is happening now into the deep learning capabilities and what is PyTorch and what are the different benefits that you have uh, once you're using PyTorch. And for that, I'd like to have Joe giving us some of these details. Cool. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so I'm not Jeff Smith, um, but Jeff Smith is my colleague. If you ever want to see a repeat of this talk, uh, he's going to come on Friday and I think give it at about 10 a.m. Um, but I am Joe Spizek, um, product manager for Facebook AI platform. So that includes PyTorch um, as well as another project called Onyx, and then our kind of broader open source strategy um, is with respect to AI. Um, one thing that's really cool is like one of the reasons why PyTorch is so popular is because of its you know customer obsessed nature. Like. Uh, the, the customers in this case are researchers, um, and really that's over the last you know, year, or year, year and a half here has shifted more towards um, being a production framework. So all those researchers that have been doing great things with the framework are now wanting to ship those into to large scale production. And so that's kind of the story I'll, I'll talk about here. Um, you know, as a project, it's only maybe a little less than two years old, so it was started in roughly uh, early 2017. So let's start with um, the higher level of why actually Facebook cares about PyTorch and, and the things that we use it for. So of course, things like ranking algorithms for recommendations. Um, if you've ever been on, on Messenger uh, and you've uh, had a recommendation from, a, from someone or been uh, chatting in a different language, if you have friends that speak other languages and like to chat, and, um, we do the, all of these translations in real time. Uh, I'll talk more about translations later on and, and where Facebook is invested there and, and, uh, and the code that we've open sourced uh, in collaboration actually with, uh, with Amazon. It's also things like 
accessibility. So if I'm, for example, um, someone who um, can't see very well, I'm, I may be blind or um, so on, you can actually uh, have accessibility features where it can actually uh, do things like text-to-speech um, based on the content within images. Uh, and that's been really powerful for, uh, for, for the uh, viewing impaired um, and using Facebook. Um, things like bots and assistants. So we have um, you know, M, and that's obviously powered by AI. Um, and things like generated content. So when you upload your, your movies um, onto Facebook, we have uh, algorithms that will go through and basically generate a preview automatically for you based on um, you know, a number of, of uh, features within your, within your video. Uh, Air effects. So has, was anyone in F8 this year? OK, no one, no one have. F8 is very small. So it's, a, it's Facebook's annual conference. Um, but we, uh, with our mobile app, we're able to generate um, you know, AR effects. Instead of having kind of this static, flat map, you just uh, overlay your phone, and it gives you this visual effect, which is really powerful. And it kind of gives you a more immersive experience. Um, and of course, VR hardware. So we have uh, Oculus as part of the family of, of uh, platforms within Facebook. And AI is a big, big part of that. So all hand tracking is machine learning based, um, you know, things like uh, lip sync movements are all tracked um, and uh, using machine learning. Um, and of course, there's a lot of bad things that happen on our platform. So things like share baiting, uh, which we try and hope you never ever see. Um, but sometimes you see it. Uh, that is uh, hopefully removed um, ahead of time using machine learning. We can tag that and remove it. Um, also things like suicide prevention that we deal with on our platform as well. Um, and all up, we do you know, over 300 trillion predictions a day. So we run at really, really large scale. So we actually need a framework that can basically take a lot of this research, this cutting edge work that we're doing, and scale it up into to large scale production very, very quickly. Uh, you can imagine we take uh, a lot of the data from some of those previous applications. Uh, we want to train that on algorithms um, and then get that deployed very, very quickly. Because you know, that type of adversarial problem, say like share baiting, uh, the data has a time value. So we want to deploy that very quickly. Um, we also uh, deploy on phones. So um, instead of sending data, for example, from uh, your phone over to our infrastructure, you can actually run locally and do predictions. Uh, so we have a runtime as part of uh, what was previously called Cafe 2, uh, runs locally on over a billion phones. And it's very compact. Um, so things like the AI camera, uh, things like uh, style transfer, uh, you know, augmented reality effects, all of that is actually using um, deep learning and running actually uh, locally on your phone. Um, and we actually have uh, a team that makes sure that even if you're using a fairly low end, say Android phone, all the way up to say, the high end iPhone, um, it's going to work pretty well for you. Um, and so one thing that, that we take is a really a full stack approach. Uh, and so when we, we talk about the research we do, we talk about the products we, we develop. Uh, we actually open source all of this as well. So all the way down from the hardware, so we do things like uh, open hardware design. So if anyone's heard of OCP, Open Compute Platform, has anyone heard of OCP? OK, good. So a few folks. So basically, we open source all of our design for our hardware. Um, we have a, a kind of a consortium around that. Um, and we do fleet-wide metrics and, and benchmarking. So we're, we're constantly looking at how's our fleet of servers doing, um, how efficient they are, uh, et cetera. Um, we have a number of compiler um, projects. So you know, how do you generate the best performance based on that hardware? Of course, uh, PyTorch 1 is our, our chosen framework, and we use that uh, across a number of workloads. Um, and then libraries, so on top of PyTorch. So there's a number of, of different libraries, like the one I'll talk about here in, in a second round translation, um, that are built on top of PyTorch. So things like Detectron, which is probably the, uh, the cutting edge, most cutting edge uh, computer vision uh, suite of algorithms that's out there. It's open source. The models are available. Um, it runs extremely fast uh, for different uh, things like object detection, segmentation, et cetera. Um, models, we open source uh, a ton of models um, based on open, so open data sets. Um, and then, of course, data sets themselves. Um, so basically, we do everything at every level of the stack, but then we also open source or open up all the things that we do. So it's a very unique place, um, Facebook is, in this regard. So um, I was chatting with some folks uh, before the, the, the talk here, and uh, a few folks hadn't heard of what, haven't heard of PyTorch, so didn't really know what PyTorch was. So I figured given you know, Dan's talk is jumping right into you know, how to use it in SageMaker, I figured I'd dive a little bit deeper into the code and show you 
Like, what is the purpose of a, of a deep learning framework? Like, how does it help you? Um, but first, it's, you know, it's popular. So PyTorch 1, um, to give you an idea, is, uh, is the number two fastest growing open source project on GitHub, to give you an idea. So it's, it's a very popular project. Uh, almost 3x number of contributors in the last 12 months. So I think the only other uh, more popular project on GitHub was Azure Docs, um, which I don't know who's using and contributing to Azure Docs, but okay. Uh, but PyTorch is, is, is really, really popular. Uh, I get people uh, come up to me all the time saying, I love the project. Um, thank you, this is amazing. Um, and so I pass that on, of course, to the dev team. Uh, but you know, when you look at the, the project itself, so what is it? It's, in a lot of ways, you can think about a framework as a number of APIs and libraries for convenience. So if anyone has taken, say, like uh, Andrew Rang's Deep Learning AI class or um, anything actually um, that takes you from, really from scratch, like writing things in, say, like NumPy, um, you'll know that it's pretty painful when you start to implement a lot of these things yourself. So what a framework really does is gives you a set of really nice APIs to do different things and accelerates them on different hardware um, you know, back ends. And so if you look at some of the, the APIs that are supported in, in PyTorch, and I'll go into the code here in the, in the next slide, but things like torch.nn is uh, a suite of APIs that allows you to define layers or define groups of layers. Um, writing those from scratch would be really painful. Optimizers, so things like SGD or Atom, um, those are implemented for you. And of course, they're open source, so you can look at how they're implemented or, or they might be calling a, a library underneath. Uh, data. Um, Having to write your, your own data iter iterator or data loader from scratch is painful. So being able to call a simple API and load data is really helpful. Uh, Autograd, this is kind of the heart and soul of, of PyTorch. And this allows you to do auto differentiation. So when you, for example, uh, define a tensor, I can actually just call, um, you know, say, like loss.backwards, and actually it does an auto differentiation for me. Writing those derivatives, writing the chain rule is kind of painful. So uh, Py, you know, frameworks, frameworks like PyTorch do this for you, makes life easy. Um, Torch.vision or TorchVision um, gives you nice, easily accessible models and data. Um, and then of course, something that's really new to the framework is what we're calling JIT or just-in-time or really uh, um, a ahead-of-time compiler. And this is uh, something I'll talk about later on, but really this is the core of how you take your code from say a research exploration mode and refactor it so that you can then take it to large-scale production. And this is actually what we do at Facebook. This is how we, we take um, our exploration, because uh, not all models are gonna go to production, maybe less than 1%, probably less than 1% of 1% go into production. But the ones we do wanna take into production, we wanna take them gracefully. We wanna take them uh, frictionless um, and scale them up. So um, hopefully you can read this code, but this is a very, this is your canonical uh, MNIST example, but it really kind of hits home how easy things get with uh, things like the, the libraries themselves. So uh, for example, uh, NN modules. So I'm defining a, a very simple network here. Um, basically two fully connected layers. Um, and you call that uh, torch.nn.linear and I can define um, you know, the parameters around those, those layers. Very simple. Um, for me to have to do that uh, manually would be a lot of work. Um, I can also call uh, things like nonlinear functions. So, when you get into the, the forward function, when I want to actually take a forward propagation um, of that defined network, um, you know, rectified linear units are, are kind of the state of the art. Some variant of rectified linear units are, are pretty much what are used um, today. Dropout, um, that's all implemented for you. Sigmoid, um, these are all functions that basically if you call torch dot, you're going to get that. It's, it's implemented. It might actually be calling something like QDNN or MKL underneath, but it's very simple. Um, the other cool thing about PyTorch is something we uh, announced uh, about a month or so ago. Um, we announced a C++ front end. And you know, you can really, it's actually kind of hard to tell the difference between the Python and the C++. So if you, uh, if you look at it, they're, they're very, very similar. Um, there's a few more colons, obviously, in the C++, but otherwise, um, you know, besides the include statement, really there's, there's not a lot of difference. This has actually empowered a lot of folks inside uh, Facebook, as well as a lot of high performance researchers that you know, wanted to squeeze that extra bit of performance out of their framework. So uh, you know, for example, our StarCraft team uh, that competes in, in competitions with their bots, uh, their application is largely C++. For them, writing this code um, fits right into their bigger application, uh, very straightforward. Uh, and then when you start to get into the training, um, it's very easy. So 
In this case, I'm loading data. So I have this nice uh, uh, utility called data loader. Um, in this case, I'm going to, to bring in a computer vision, um, uh, a data set for computer vision for MNIST. So I can just basically call uh, the torch.datasets, torchvision.datasets API. Uh, I can specify my optimizer, uh, in this case, stochastic gradient descent, very simple. Um, and then from here, I can basically uh, set the number of epochs um, and train my model. Um, so things like uh, um, you know, actually doing backpropagation is as simple as calling loss.backwards. And it actually goes in and does a backprop for me. Um, and then at the end there, I'm just doing a checkpoint um, based on modulo, uh, if there's a, a remainder or not. And you can see the analogous uh, C++ code. So it's, it's actually very, very simple. If you had to implement all of this yourself um, in something uh, else, it would be quite painful. So that's really what a framework um, brings for you. So let's, let's talk about the, the problem of research to production, because this is the problem that, that's near and dear to me. It's something that, um, it's actually how I'm judged at Facebook, how fast we can get research into production and how, uh, in a production scale and solve some of these problems. Um, so if you remember, there's this project called Onyx. Has everyone heard of Onyx? So Onyx, okay, a few folks. So Onyx is Open Neural Network Exchange. So this was something we developed actually in partnership with Amazon uh, a little over a year ago. And it's a project that's still going. It's still got a lot of momentum. And we actually use it in large scale today at, at Facebook for a number of applications, translation being one of them. Uh, we had another pr uh, framework called Cafe2, which is embedded really deeply into our infrastructure. Uh, it runs uh, most of our applications today at a pretty large scale. Um, and really, Onyx was the bridge to try and get PyTorch models, which were largely research-based, into uh, Cafe2 for large-scale inference. Um, and so, you know, Onyx was, was nice, and it really helped us, but we actually wanted to move faster. And that's why we actually uh, started doing this uh, work around PyTorch1. So, you know, how do we prototype, avoid the transfer, but then deploy um, all in the same framework? That basically became what we call PyTorch. And that's, that's uh, really what PyTorch 1 is. And so to, to sum up what PyTorch 1 is in one sentence, it's for us a seamless path from AI research to production. So all the teams that, uh, across Facebook, and now we're starting to see uh, external teams, uh, different research groups in different companies, are starting to, uh, to look at PyTorch as a production framework, not just something that they can explore and hack on. Um, this is a real framework that is going to uh, scale um, as well as any, uh, but give you that flexibility. So I'll dive a little bit more into what production actually means. So when we say transitioning from research to production, uh, it means in the same environment. So that's the seamless part. So I'm not having to export a model, import a model, um, change environments. It's all the same code base. Um, and that means things are fully loaded. So there's basically, um, we expose things like just torch.distributed for distributed training. Uh, things like you know, mobile, which we're working on for the future here. Um, you know, all these APIs, basically anything performance and related and scaling is exposed to the user on the front end through Python. Um, Opt-in, so flexibility is, is basically maintained um, and you only need to trade basically um, opt-in um, into different things when you need them. In other words, you pay only for what you really want to use. So I can have all the flexibility of Python, um, but when I start to transition into a production mode, I start to trade off that flexibility because I want to be able to scale that model um, in, say, some type of C++ serving environment like SageMaker. Um, and again, uh, same environment. So it allows me really to refactor my model continuously without having to change environments. So I have to basically go and serialize my model, import it into another framework, do anything like that. I actually can just refactor in the same environment. <clears throat> so what does production concretely mean? So for us at Facebook, it actually means hardware efficiency. So you know, I'm, I'm judged on, on things like how, you know, how well we're, we're utilizing our infrastructure. So whether it's CPUs, GPUs, or custom accelerators um, you know, that either we're, that we're building ourselves or, or through other, other vendors. Um, scalability, so you know, power is expensive, so we need to utilize uh, our GPUs and our infrastructure as much as possible. Um, so distributed training efficiency becomes really important. And I'll talk about that uh, with respect to translation in a minute. And then cross-platform. So how do I serve models um, in an environment where there's no Python interpreter? That's a challenge. Uh, and you know, mobile is, is a great environment for that. 
Um, so mobile devices uh, in our infrastructure, serving Python is pretty much a no-no um, unless we, um, we make an exception for it and it's a time to market um, type of, of situation. So we have this thing called torch.jit that I talked about um, a little bit earlier. So you know things like um, experimenting. So you kind of have the, your full flexibility of PyTorch. So think Pythonic, think NumPy, um, but with GPUs and, and high performance, you know tensor ops. Um, I can then take um, basically parts of my graph. I can extract parts that I care about. So things like if I'm going to serve the model, I can extract a part of that graph and go and serve that, um, and I can identify that using TorchJIT. Um, and then, of course, um, how do I optimize and deploy? So Dan talked about deploying at scale with SageMaker. How do I take those whole program optimizations and deploy without Python in the environment? Um, so one thing that, um, you know, when you look at frameworks, um, you know, historically you've had these, these eager and, and static frameworks. So when we talk about production, uh, you know, eager mode has never been something that has been production like you've never been able to take eager mode production uh, models directly into a scaling environment to, to, to run those at large scale inference. Basically, the difference between uh, eager and static is when I actually define my model, I'm actually defining the graph as I'm defining it. So it's a kind of a defined by run environment. In the case of a static graph, so something like CAFE2 um, or say a TensorFlow um, type of model, I'm actually writing my, I'm doing kind of a meta programming um, where I'm actually defining my graph, I have to compile that graph, um, and then from there I actually have this kind of static graph which I'll, I can do uh, new predictions with, and that's what I use for, for inference. Um, so they, they both have a lot of uh, pl you know, pluses and minuses. Um, from the eager front end uh, perspective, this is actually what researchers love. Um, research is a dynamic environment. I don't know if my idea is going to work or not. So I might iterate hundreds or thousands of times. I might try hyperparameters. I might try different layers. Um, so they like the idea of having something that allows them to express any idea possible. Um, it gets them um, really uh, innovating, um, thinking about different ideas, thinking about different approaches. Um, but it's hard to optimize and hard to deploy. So that's been always the knock on, on Eager. It's always fun to, to uh, debug Python, but getting that into large scale production, typically not going to happen. From a static graph, the exact opposite is true. So it is easy to optimize. I can take a graph, it's static graph. I, I can optimize that very, very easily. Um, I can deploy it. But man, once that static graph is compiled, um, having to, to rewrite that and, and recompile that every single time um, and debug it. I can't use print statements, for example, um, or Python debugger. It becomes very, very hard as a, as a researcher looking to iterate fast uh, and do real time uh, research. So that's something that we've, we've thought a lot about and something that we've uh, brought with PyTorch and, and some of the things we're doing with this new PyTorch 1 platform. So again, um, PyTorch is your models part of Python program uh, with autograds for generating derivatives. Um, it's simple, it's debuggable, so print statements, yay, I can use those. Um, it's hackable, so I can plug in with other Python libraries, so anyone who loves Python should love PyTorch. Um, but of course, it needs Python to run, and it's difficult to optimize and parallelize. Um, but we've added this thing called script mode. And so when you start to think about, okay, this is a model that is functioning and, and meeting the requirements of something I want to actually take into production. This is when I start to look at how do I take that, how do I script that model, or how do I trace that model, and get that into something that can be deployable into a production environment. So where I basically have no, no Python dependency, I can optimize it, I can start to use other libraries that are more um, hard-coded and, and optimized for serious performance in serious infrastructure uh, like we have. And that's really what we, we have as, as far as PyTorch JIT. So this is what we're betting uh, big time on. We're betting on basically this tool uh, allowing you to have the same environment, same research development environment, but allow you to gradually refactor your code using a couple of wrappers, or what we call decorators. And uh, there's a, a bunch of tutorials online. If you go to pytorch.org, you can check those out. Um, but really, there's, there's two that matter, and that's really the, the script decorator um, and the trace decorator. And they're both handy, and they can be used interoperable, so you can use them both together. But at a high level, what trace does is actually runs dummy data through your network 
and actually generates a graph. Um, and so it'll actually trace a graph um, out of something that is purely imperative. As I'm writing it, it will actually generate the graph for me in real time. It's very cool. It's, this is very handy and very good for feed forward networks. Computer vision, CNNs, works really, really well. Once you start to get into things like uh, you know, language models that use control flow, so I'll talk about in a, in a second the translation work. So control flow is nasty. Um, it's data dependent in some cases. Um, and so basically what we've done is created also a script decorator. And what this does is actually constrains you into a subset of a Python looking language. It's really a domain specific language, a DSL, um, that does not depend on a Python interpreter. And so when you kind of give a, get an idea of what you want to do, you can start to use the, the script decorator. Control flow will be preserved and it allows you then uh, to save and load that model into a C++ environment. So all of a sudden you're free of Python and you can actually run it really uh, large scale very efficiently. So I'll talk briefly about translation um, in SageMaker. So this is a collaboration between Amazon and Facebook. So very briefly, uh, translation at Facebook has a history. We started out using Bing Translate way back in the day uh, in 2013. Uh, we started uh, bringing all that in house in 2015 uh, and started using neural machine translation in 2016. And from then on, it's been basically all NMT. Um, and it's been very good. So, you know, our progress is, has been good. I think we've, we're now at almost 6 billion translations a day. Um, it's a slow graphic. And it's used, oh, sorry, it's used in things like social recommendations, engagement bait, uh, suicide prevention, and a lot of other applications. And you can see, um, you know, uh, kind of it in action here. So this is uh, Juan, one of the research scientists in our translation team and his kids, talking about uh, the fact that they love chocolate ice cream. And that's uh, translated in real time. And one of the things we talked about previously was performance and distributed training. I think the, one of the gentlemen over here um, asked me about that. So as part of PyTorch 1, uh, we support distributed training. And then, of course, uh, working with Amazon, we've enabled that through SageMaker. But we actually brought this down on really large data sets uh, that we have in internally um, down to 32 minutes. So we can train these really large data sets with FairSeq, which is a sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence, uh, translation library that we've open sourced and that uh, has been optimized for SageMaker. Um, and so doing large scale training on say 128 GPUs, and that can be on a P3 instance, for example, um, takes us, for example, 32 minutes. So if new data comes in, we can train very, very quickly. Someone can go and get a coffee and they come back and, and they have production models trained. So now uh, I'm gonna hand it back over to Dan to talk about, um, about the CycleGAN work on SageMaker using PyTorch. Um, and one uh, quick note here, so the FairSeq uh, work is actually in this bit.ly here. So uh, I think this is actually Dan's uh, GitHub account <laughs> for now, but it'll be in the, uh, in the examples folder in SageMaker soon. Um, but this is, again, jointly optimized work. Uh, this is actually what we use in production today at Facebook, these, you know, these models, uh, these architectures, um, and this is optimized in SageMaker. So grab those, check them out. Um, we do six billion translations a day with it. It's, it's pretty awesome, very high performance. So we'll jump into the DC GAN next. Here you go. Okay, thank you so much, Joe. Um, so, just for a quick recap. Um, so Joe spoke about the details of PyTorch and how it really drives the momentum from research to production for different um, data scientists and developers. I mean, I got hooked on PyTorch a year and a half ago um, when working with a customer. And I walked in, and I was talking about different um, uh, deep learning frameworks because, again, at AWS, we support um, all of them. And <clears throat> the customer actually convinced me um, to, to get to play around with PyTorch and see how easy it makes things. And uh, what I thought I would do is to walk you through a practical example. We don't have all the time we need to go through what exactly is a generative adversarial network, uh, but I found it to be cool enough to show you exactly how to put the things that Joe mentioned in practice. And again, the code is available on GitHub, so you can pick it up today and play around with it. <clears throat> um, so when, when I started learning PyTorch, uh, again, about a year and a half ago, 
I, it was really easy for me to, to pick that up and then, and then follow through the execution as opposed to the way deep learning looked like before where you have to build a computational graph and optimize that graph and eventually that graph runs in a very optimal manner but if you have a problem it's really hard to debug it, right? So with PyTorch it's really easy to just walk through exactly what you're trying to build and then follow the execution step by step so that you can troubleshoot that through time. That's one of the key benefits that I picked up. And it's great to see the movement now with ONX where um, you can develop in PyTorch in a very sequential manner. And then after you're done developing, you can convert your model in a very optimized binary that you can run here or there. So just to look at, so this is, who here is familiar with generative other serial networks and GANs? Okay. So the, the, the idea here is to train two networks, neural networks that work together, and then one is um, designed to basically discriminate between real faces and fake faces in the case of this example. And the discriminator in this case is trained towards um, to understand whenever it sees a new picture, whether that picture is a real uh, picture or not. And a generator is designed to, to generate net new pictures from basically nonsense data, AKA noise. And it's trained against um, the, the goal of being able to fool the discriminator into making sure the discriminator is not able to tell whether a picture was fake or not. And so the equilibrium state that you get here is where you have the generator getting better and better at generating uh, uh, um, fake features, uh, uh, pictures in this case that look real and a discriminator uh, basically landing at a coin flip of 50-50 whether it thinks the, the, the picture is, um, is real or not. And then if you, if you want to extrapolate that use case into many other um, scenarios like fraud detection or anomaly detection or, or privacy and different other use cases like that, generative adversarial networks uh, seem to be very, very practical um, in those domains. So this is the structure of, of my code. I'm, I'm executing things on SageMaker, but at the same time, I'm using my own laptop to develop things. And thanks to the SageMaker SDK, I can actually have that relationship where I leverage the, the hardware from, from SageMaker as for, uh, yet using my, my own laptop for development. So here, the normal, this, uh, uh, the, this is the, okay, let me start with the neural network. And then it, there's a lot to cover, so I would advise you to just go read the code on, on GitHub. But the key callouts here are, well, we're creating a generator using a generator class, leveraging the neural network, the NN module uh, um, library that is provided by PyTorch. And the anatomy of an NN module is, is very simple. In the init, um, in the init uh, um, method of the class, basically what you have to do is to construct your neural network. If you've ever seen um, a, a neural network before, it's essentially uh, a set of linear combination that you potentially do some convolutions on in case you, you want to do image analysis or do other types of transformations on and then you, you put that in sequences and then you decide whether you want to keep the gradients from these different calculations uh, or the different parameters associated with these calculations or not. And then if you keep these gradients, then the backward propagation process is basically designed to compute the the, the rate of change of the loss function with regards to the rate of change of these weights. So that's the whole architecture, mental model of building a deep learning model. So in the init class, what you have to do is to describe your neural network. In the case of a generator, that's what we do here. And <clears throat> this small part is basically initialization of the weights or the parameters of that generator. And the, the other important thing that I want to call out here is this forward function. So every time you see a PyTorch code, um, where a neural network is being constructed, you always see uh, the module created and the forward pass. You never see the backward function unless the problem becomes very, very complex because PyTorch essentially makes the backward propagation, the calculation of the gradients, and then the tracking of all of these rates of changes automatic for you. That's the essence of Autograd. So when you construct a neural network with PyTorch, you always have the, the design of the neural network mm -hmm and then the forward function, which basically passes the data through the neural network. Mm -hmm. So we're doing that here for the generator, and then we're doing the same thing for the discriminator. Um, and essentially what the generator does is that it takes any random uh, vector of noise and then does transpose convolutions to it in order to come up with the structure of an image 
and then it's trained against making that image look as real as possible. And the discriminator does the opposite. It takes an image looking something, and then it does convolutions, some type of object detection stuff on that, and then it has a sigmoid activation uh, or, or logistic, uh, or lo yeah, logistic acti activation function at the end, basically comp uh, computing the probability of that image, the binary probability of that image being um, uh, real or fake. So that's really what it looks like. In this single piece of code in my neural net file, I've described the generator and then the discriminator, and then I can make them both work together. Now, the next thing that is important <clears throat> as far as, because in this example, we're using uh, a PyTorch to train, to build and train the neural network, but we're also using um, a TensorBoard in order to visualize different things, like the loss function, uh, like some images, and like everything else that is related. Now, I I've had someone asking me a couple of days ago, um, if I use HMaker, and then I want to add additional libraries like OpenAI Gym if, if I'm into reinforcement learning or anything, anything else. What can I do on SageMaker? Well, the good news is if you, if you add in these requirements, the text file within your source directory of your code and you deploy that to SageMaker, it's designed to pick that up and then understands that you need these extra libraries and then go and install them automatic for, automatically for you. So that's basically what I've done here. And again, not, no time to cover everything, but I wanted to make sure I hit this point. Your requirements of text file is important. Put that in there, SageMaker would find it, and then it's going to install everything that is in that requirements of text file. And that's what I've done here to have uh, TensorBoard capabilities. Now the next thing is my main function, the function that is actually going to leverage that neural network description, and then do the iteration, and do the training, and do the logging, of the, 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 the variables and everything else to, to, um, to tend to board. <clears throat> so in this main function, again, I call the PyTorch library, which are very easy and easy to remember. Joe described them just now, where you have Torch. Torch distributed gives you distributed capabilities. Torch NN is what gives you the module. And then parallel and optimization are basically capabilities for building you know, distributed networks, and optimization is for the loss function and then the backward prop uh, uh, propagation. Um, and then you have some utilities functions as well for, for handling the data and handling some computer vision use cases. So the API is actually not complex. And again, it's very easy to track and follow. Um, so the next thing that I've done here is that from my neural net file, I import my generator and my discriminator. Um, I have some utility functions here to do different things like loading the data and I have some loggers that are available. And then from TensorBoard X, which is a library to basically uh, log, tent log PyTorch, uh, a very, uh, different type of data points onto TensorBoard, I do import a, a class called Summary Writer. And it's a Summary Writer that gives me access to this writer object uh, to which I point to what, what I call a TensorBoard log directory. Now, this log directory is essentially an environment variable that SageMaker provides and the environment variable is called output data directory. So again, I'm building my own neural network and my own algorithm, but I'm aware that SageMaker would provide that output data directory for me so that if I put something there, SageMaker is gonna pick that up at the end of a training job and put that over to Amazon S3. That's the relationship between PyTorch, SageMaker, and me as a developer. Again, AI-driven development. Um, now, I start my summary writer and these are basically some small helper libraries to load the models I create, I load my generators. Um, the, the next important thing here is my training function. So in my training function, I do, I, I lay down the steps here so that you could read through because we don't have the time to cover everything. But in the, in, in the training function here, I essentially go through um, some of the details about my environment. I try to find out if I have GPUs available, and if I have GPUs available, I just say, hey, I want to do distributed training. And then SageMaker also would provide me with environment variables that would tell me the number of hosts that are involved in this training exercise. And as soon as I have that, <coughs> I know that I can do distributed training on these, um, on these um, um, different machines. So the rest of the code <coughs> is really about loading the generator, loading the discriminator, uh, the optimizer, and everything, and then adding some uh, mechanisms to, to logging the data over to TensorBoard. Um, there's a lot going on there, but it's very easy to read, hopefully. 
and, the, the, and I try to comment everything so that you can track that through execution. The idea there is all these extra classes and extra library like the average meter and other stuff is a mechanism to be capturing data as you're training your model and then pushing that over to TensorBoard as the, the model training is started. And SageMaker knows how to grab that, put that over for you on, on, on Amazon S3. And then I start my training loop and then I go through the epochs and for each epoch, I, I do some tracking, how much time did it take for me to, to load in the data. And um, going through the code a little faster here because I want to hit important point. Um, after the whole execution of a training, everything is commented so you can go through that. Uh, I basically write the, the, uh, I basically write the information that I have back to, uh, back to a file or back to, to TensorBoard. So the idea here is I've created my generator and my disseminator. I pass that through the model. I start my training loop and I do my feed forward and backward propagation, what PyTorch helps with. But I also have TensorBoard enabled and I have that summary writer that helps me write things uh, back to, to TensorBoard. And I, have my, um, and I have a mechanism to write the real files to a local folder for me again in that output data directory. And because this is about generating images, I also want to see these files at the end of the execution. SageMaker is very useful in that sense because it will capture all of that data that I saved to that output data directory and then push that back to the cloud storage at the end of the execution. So two more minutes, guys, we're almost done. So the, what, what the experience looks like at the end of the day is um, I can go back to my Jupyter notebook now and then start the process of you know, playing around with the data a little bit, doing some data exploration. That's what I was doing here. I got into the data and then looked at some of those faces that I wanted to play with um, just, to, just to make sure that I had the right data set. But this is where the training uh, really begins. So if you remember the anatomy of the you know, training job kickstart with, with SageMaker, I still use the same PyTorch estimator. I use the main function that, you, that we just walked through. I point it to the source directory, which has the requirements of text file. And then um, I point it to the framework version of PyTorch that I want, and SageMaker knows to go give me PyTorch 1.0 in case that's what I pointed to. And I say I want two instances, and I want the P3 instance, which is a, 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 a CPU-based Volta instance. And I say, OK, then I want to go through for 30 epochs, and I could, have, I could have added extra hyperparameters here, and the framework would know how to, to kick that off. Now, this is the interesting part. Based on the estimator, if I say fit it to the inputs, and the inputs here are basically pointing to, to the data set on my S3 bucket, what SageMaker would do is that it would kick off, it would kick off the job, and the, red, the green color and the red color uh, logs here are basically the logs that are coming from different nodes that are involved in the, in the computation. So I could have decided to kick off the job and not wait for the logs. That's what that wait variable that you saw earlier is, is about. But if I wait for the logs, what SageMaker is going to do is that it's going to go back to all these machines that are contributing, fetch the logs, and bring them back to me on my client, wherever my client is. And then I see different colored logs that, that I can track for different execution. Now, the few things I wanted to show you here are the things like SageMaker installing these libraries that are in the requirement of text file for me. That's basically what is happening here. Uh, the logs are long, but I'll catch that, and we will be done. Yeah, so at a point SageMaker starts, it says, okay, you want these libraries, I'm gonna go fetch them for you. In the, in, I had image IO, for example, in my requirements of text file, so it went and, and then searched that. Um, as long as it's pip installable, it can download and install that for me, and so on and so forth, all the way up until it has all the required libraries that you need to basically start, um, start the training job. And then whatever you print out of your, uh, whatever you print to standard out, like print whatever, SageMaker is gonna pick that up and then push that out to the logs as well for you. And so this, this is basically the training experience. So in this case, I've been using two GPUs on the cloud to GPU machines on the cloud to train my, my workload. The other interesting thing is that at the end of the execution, uh, SageMaker would give me all these logs that are metrics from the GPU, CPU utilization, and everything that, are, that I need to, to visualize the execution so far. So that's what you get from the CloudWatch logs. 
And I can, I can also get the logs actually that came out that I was looking at in the case I, I was waiting for, for the logs, or I, I, I can have that stored somewhere on the cloud, uh, on AWS CloudWatch logs, and, and never look at it if I'm not interested. But this is what you guys were all looking for. So at the end of the execution of a job, in, in the specific example that I showed you, I've been generating pictures at the end of every epoch just to be able to see what, a, what is the output of my fake, what is the output of my real, and then if there's anything there that is interesting. So all of these I put SageMaker put in the output folder that I can now come in and look at and say, okay, this is really for each epoch what a fake image looks like, right? So this is really cool in a, in a, in a case you, you want to do the kind of deep learning that really requires you to do some analysis at the end. The relationship between SageMaker, PyTorch, and TensorBoard um, give you that capability. So there I was looking at some, some of the images, but the other cool thing that, I've, that, that is possible to do here is to basically uh, look, at, look at the logs. For example, you can create a GIF or a GIF, depending on how you, can, you want to pronounce that. Uh, you can create a GIF to, to start visualizing your, your execution and your logs afterwards. And all of these things that you can create within the container in your main script, SageMaker can pick that up and then, and then save that for you afterwards. So here I can see how my uh, uh, generator is getting better and better at, at basically creating fake images. That means its own loss function is going down. And my discriminator is still very good because it knows you know, what is a good and what is a bad image. But over time, you, you will see that the generator's lo loss or error is going down and discriminator error is going up and they're gonna meet each other somewhere around 50% of around a point of stability. So that was for the loss, and then you could also visualize some of the epochs, you know, and what the images are, are, are looking like through time. Now, the last thing is the TensorBoard experience. So because I've, because I've created all of these uh, uh, logs and then I stored them using, again, TensorBoard X and PyTorch, I can now kick off a TensorBoard environment where I can visualize all of these things. And TensorBoard is powerful in the sense that you can save scalars, which are real values, and really anything that you have uh, on your mind. So in this case, I tried to track um, the average batch time, the time it takes for me to just like run through a single batch, or the time it takes for me to load data. Whatever you have in mind, you can put that on, on top of there, and that's why I had these average meters. And then TensorBoard is going to present those for you. So if you go be creative about the type of error you want to log, but the example that I have there can show you a few different types of things to log. And then so I can plot the average loss for the generator and then the, some of the values that came out of the discriminators through time. And I could also plot, uh, plot the batch time and then plot the data time, the time it took to load the data and so on and so forth. So all of these things are stored. And again, SageMaker picks that up and then sends the log back to you so that you can visualize with TensorBoard. Um, the last thing is also the ability to visualize the images themselves side by side, right? So using TensorBoard X, as you're going through training, it doesn't matter if you're using multiple machines. If you store these images, then um, SageMaker can pick that up, that up and then send it to TensorBoard for you to visualize later on. So this really brings, again, the whole concept of AI-driven development together where you can be writing code for building and training deep learning models, but at the same time, you are also spinning up infrastructure, tearing that down, and at the same time, you're building the, cap of the metadata that you would need in order to explain and have a conversation about uh, the deep learning model that you train with your team and with your management and things like that. So with that, I know we're a little bit over time, and thanks again for, for, for sticking around. Um, we will be standing right out there if you have any question and if you want to follow up on any of these. Uh, the information for the, yeah. So this is a CTA where you can get the, the PyTorch environment and then the, the DCGAN example code that, that we have, it's, it's on GitHub. Thank you so much.